Hello, and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you for more podcasting greatness. And you can see this week, I am joined by Gavin Fox. Now, Gavin is someone who is involved. Welcome to the show, Gavin. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm just we're going to get right into it here. I'm just jumping right into this. Uh, this, is a, this is a follow-up to the podcast I did a couple weeks ago about QAnon and the QAnon conspiracy, the QAnon movement, its beginnings on 4chan and growth into social media and the public discourse uh, resulting in... Well, a great deal of, uh, of nonsense uh, being spread all across the United States and the world about President Trump and conspiracies of uh, child pedophiles uh, and or, or sorry, pedophiles in the DNC and Hillary Clinton and celebrities and basically anybody who ever said anything bad about Donald Trump. And this just kind of goes on and on. And there's all kinds of legs to this and, and all kinds of places to go. And if you are if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then this probably isn't the first podcast you're going to want to watch. There, you check out my earlier one uh, to get the basics of what this is all about. We're going to assume going into this podcast that we're not going to have to necessarily retrace all of the origins and and talk about all the the ways and means that QAnon rose, but because um, we've already covered some of that, but we're gonna we're gonna go into more detail. And the 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 aim of this talk today is to teach me more about this. I want to know more. And I've been looking around uh, on the internet, talking to different people, trying to basically get them on my show to discuss this with me. And I found something called the Q Origins Project uh, and reached out to them, started having some interactions. And as a result, we are having this conversation today with Gavin. So first, Gavin, hi, welcome to the show again. And thank you very much for taking the time to be here. It's my pleasure. Awesome. Uh, first off, why don't we go ahead and establish with uh, my audience who you are and how you're involved in this. Uh, it's not like there's some degree you can go get on cue. You know, it's just something that we've been following since 2018 when this thing right. first started. So how have you, how do you get involved in this and, and how is it that this, you know, and, and, and what's your involvement with this Q Origins project? Uh, my involvement in it, I've been keeping up with Q since uh, spring of 2019 sometime. A family member brought it to my attention. Um, up to that point, my only exposure to it had been, ironically, a, a Facebook article about you know QAnon and how it's tearing apart families and, and breaking relationships. So, which thankfully has not happened to any of my relationships over QAnon. So, um, but it you know it's a fascinating concept and and you know having having a close family member that was that was uh i don't know if there's an involved per se but that was interested in it i started keeping up with it um and just you know keeping up with it on at at a personal level up until earlier this spring um and of course you know over the past year especially year and a half or so with you know, between covid um, the U.S. election, you know, QAnon's taken off in all different directions, exploded massively numbers-wise. Uh, last fall, on I noticed on Twitter that you know the same Q Origins project that you you mentioned and and followed that account. Um, he had just written his first few threads about the very beginning of Q on 4chan. Um, you know, when when that figure first showed up on 4chan, you know, when he first got noticed, what he was writing about and all that. And that's, you know, the almost nobody who's involved in QAnon is aware of any of that. Uh, you know, that's the 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 kind of hidden history of the movement. Mm. Uh, so that was that was really interesting to me. Um, I was still only keeping up with it on a at a personal level. I was also watching a lot of the uh, you know, after the election started keeping up with law Twitter because they were covering the post-election, uh, you know, legal challenges and, and fraud allegations and all such, um, which is 
which is something I still continue to cover because there's that overlap with with QAnon. Uh, but then in the sometime in this spring, I had had an interaction with Q Origins uh, and he invited me to to join in as a research assistant. I think at the time I was one of three and uh, the other two were working on actually a, a kind of a data science project, uh, which was using image metadata from images that Q posted to try to narrow down, you know, whatever information they could could find from him on that and specifically where he was posting from. So um, I don't have the, the technical skills to contribute much to that. My, my contribution was helping them edit the write-up. Wow. So there's quite a bit of uh, interest in this. I mean, to the point that data scientists are, are you know, doing analyses of, of imagery and stuff to try to track down sources. I mean, this is pretty involved. And and good on you guys for the work you're doing on this to try to, like, de you know, de deconstruct, figure this whole thing out. Um, you know, of course, I have about a billion questions, and I don't know, you know, and, and if, if I ask you stuff, you don't know anything, it's totally fine, you know, no big deal, we'll just move on. But I want to, um, I do want to know everything you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, so let me let me ask you first. Let me uh, let me start. Go back to the very beginning of this thing, and I think something you just said is actually very very key to the growth of this movement, and that is that a lot of people apparently who are involved in it don't even know where it came from. Right. Um, yeah. Four chan in general, you know, for the general population, most people I don't think have even heard of it, right. and of the ones who have heard of it, they've heard the name you know, mostly and have no idea what the website actually is. Uh, so maybe a brief explanation of that would be good, you know, for your audience. 4chan is a an image board website. It's a, or a message board website, you could call it. It is set up where unless you put in a name specifically, you are, you always are an anonymous poster. So there's no I, I believe that you can sign in with an account uh, to keep track of what you've posted in the past, but it's, it identifies you by an ID number, uh, you know, just a randomized number. And I believe that even changes, you know, based on your IP address or, or things like that. So very, you know, clever posters can, can truly mask their identity and, you know, play, play sock puppets for themselves and, and then there's also the option to put in a name and also uh, what's called the trip code, which is you type in a password in the in the trip code field, and it scrambles it, you know, through a, an encryption algorithm into a randomized string of characters. So it's still difficult for someone else to reverse engineer that and, and assume your identity, um, and that way you can identify yourself consistently if you do want to. Um, right, and that's the, how they know. Because of that trip code, which is you, basically everybody gets a unique ID and a unique number, and that trip code, uh, Q had the Q account had a had a unique trip code. That's how people knew it was the same poster, or the same account, right? Right, and uh, they they did have some some trip ups with that over time because the encryption algorithm for those trip codes is, uh, and this is where not being the tech guy bites me, but it's it was developed you know 40 years ago in the late 70s so it's it, it's been cracked and you know there's a a lot of tools out there to to reverse engineer those but but yeah in in general the the identification method for Q once he did start ident identifying himself was through a trip code got it um, okay or chan as a whole has several different boards you know uh, sub divisions of the website um, I don't, I don't know what all of them are. I do know they have, you know, one for gun enthusiasts. They have one that's just called random and it's, you know, it, random stuff. There was, um, there's a politically incorrect board, I think poll, P-O-L, um, which is, I think where Q started. There are, um, are, are there? I believe there's also boards uh, that sort of focus on fat Board. shaming, and there's some anti-Semitic stuff, and then there apparently are other boards that are completely benign and share cartoon gifs or 
share, you know, ideas about sci-fi or something. I mean, it's a, apparently quite a wide-ranging place. And I, I wanted to to get, you know, get your descriptions and ideas on 4chan because I, I wanted to sort of figure out for myself what this place is. It's it's sort of this free speech frontier where anything goes, kind of. Um, at one point, I guess Q went from, I guess about a month in, I guess Q went from 4chan to 8chan because 4chan was, was, was being moderated too much or something. I, I don't know. What do you yeah, know that, about this? That happened a couple months in. Uh, okay, so Q started out posting on the what's called politically incorrect or poll for short uh, was where he hung out as far as we know, exclusively on that board. Okay. Uh, about a month in, cause he, he started posting end of October in 2017 by the end of November. Uh, he had had the site administrators set up a separate board for him and had moved over there on still on 4chan. Um, Actually, I take that back. He moved on to another user's board called the Calm Before the Storm. Uh, oh. That was set up by uh, a guy named, known as Baruch the Scribe, the South African user, uh, and then moved from, from that board. That was when he moved over to uh, 8chan. Was he, um, when they had a, like I said, his, his trip code was, hit, was cracked. There were people impersonating him on other boards and such. And then the administrator of the Calm Before the Storm board disabled the trip codes. And it's a big drama thing. Got uh, it. But yeah, that, at that point, he, he move, moved over to 8chan, where the administrator set him up with his own board, where he was the only user who could post on it. So he had the, uh, and I don't, I don't remember which boards were which, but Q had one where only he could post. And then the Anons that, followed him over from 4chan, Anons being the users uh, for the uh, for the site. They had a separate board where they could discuss whatever he posted on his board. Okay, got it. And do I have it right that the guy who set up 8chan in the first place and gave Q his own board and, and promoted this was Frederick Brennan? Frederick, Frederick Brennan, uh, he started 8chan. Mm -hmm. By the time that all this happened, he had already sold it to uh, Jim Watkins. Who oh, was, uh, it was already uh, sold at this point. Okay. Yeah. So uh, um, Brennan, I believe, was still working for 8chan at the time, but he he wasn't pulling strings or calling shots or anything. Um, okay. He, he was the site designer, but he, he wasn't running it at the time. Um, okay, so he was already not a a, a kingpin figure at this point because he'd yeah, already so sold uh, 8chan. He set up because 4chan was too limited, too moderated, and he wanted <laughs> absolute free speech. So he sets right. up 8chan, and then Q, and then he sells it to Jim Watkins, who's who's featured all of these guys, all these players are featured in the Q documentary on HBO. If you want to see what they look like and sound like. Um, because Fred has expressed a great deal of remorse and uh, seeming, you know, like, wow, I really wish none of this had happened kind of attitude about a lot of this. Yeah, Fred, like you said, he, he set up 8chan as a free speech absolutist deal um, after the Gamergate scandal on 4chan where they kind of cracked down on, you know, on moderating moderating certain kinds of content and speech on there. Um, you know, 8chan was a reaction to that for absolute free speech. And like you said, yeah, um, in in the years since then, uh, Mr. Brennan's kind of come around to, like, maybe we should moderate some things so that, <laughs> you know, um, so he, he has uh, had a bit of a change of heart on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think administering an abs a free speech absolutist site or moderating a free speech absolutist site for three years will do that to you. He he seemed to have been uh, quite uh, distraught over what you know some of the things that he uh, saw and, and heard over that time. Um, he hasn't gone into a lot of detail on that, and I've actually reached out to Fred and and uh, and we're he's he doesn't seem willing to to discuss it. 
Um, but fair enough, you know, uh, but that's that's what happened. So I'm curious about 4chan. Can you tell me more about who goes to that board and and what it is that draws people to that site? Uh, well, as far as who goes to it, I think kind of like you got got towards earlier, it's some of everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's there's a lot of different boards on there that are are directed towards you know specific interests or hobbies. Uh, there's the the poll board pulls in people of all types, and uh, I think part of the draw of it is that you can go there and have conversations that you won't find on other websites because, you know, Twitter or, well, not as well as they should, but Facebook and Twitter and, and places like that will shut down, you know, if there's the, if there's literal Nazis posting on the, posting Nazi stuff on there, they'll, they'll, you know, take that content down. And so you can't, you know, and when you go look at the poll board, which is what I'm mostly familiar with, you'll, you'll see, you know, in the same thread, you'll see someone talking, saying that, you know, Hitler did nothing wrong and, and really we should keep immigrants out of the U.S. and all this. But then you'll also see, and they're outnumbered, but you still see it where people will show up and say, hey, you just hate Jews and like, that's your whole deal. You know, and it's like there, there, there's the whole spectrum represented on that board and it's unfettered, you know, un, unrestricted for the most part, as long as you're not doing or saying something that's literally illegal, uh, you know, as far as that board goes, at least. Right, as far as 4chan goes. Because they do moderate when... Like I'm, I, 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 from what I, from what I've seen of this, and I, and I really, ha- you know, that's why I'm asking. I have so many questions, but it seems that they moderate when the FBI calls them and says you have to take this down. <laughs> you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Otherwise, they kind of don't really care. That's just out there. Yeah. So, four chan will will moderate things if the FBI is able to to pressure them into it, but that's kind of about the limit, you know, as far as uh, what they moderate goes. Right. Um, what was it? Uh, what What was it that, um, you know, Gamergate was a was a difficult and I understand multi layered or complicated issue, uh, at least in some people's minds. I, I don't particularly see it as very complicated from my understanding of it, but it seems to have been a bit of an earlier beginning to some of the phenomena that that created the the QAnon phenomenon. Um, can you explain, you know, from your understanding at least, what what GamerGate was and why that was significant enough that Fred felt he had to go create 8chan to, in response to it? What was that about? I'm not extremely well versed on it myself. Okay. Uh, my understanding is that there was a some kind of large scale disagreement among the community on 4chan regarding. Um, women developing video games yeah I believe. and I, I haven't read up on the history of that i do know it was uh a large part of the um driving force be- behind a lot of people leaving 4chan to go to 8chan and that was kind of where 8chan got its first uh you know big boost like big influx of users um you know so when you look at the longtime users of 8chan that's where a lot of them came in was during that uh which like i said i don't know the the specific history of of the gamergate deal but that kind of gives you an idea of you know what kind of people are on 8chan versus what kind were on 4chan it's you know the ones that were too radical or too outspoken or violent or whatever even for 4chan ended up over on 8chan so right Right, and uh, that's so that's kind of how I saw it, and uh, and of course, um, you know the whether it was the forestated, you know, or premeditated purpose of GamerGate to harass and stalk women on the on the internet and ruin their lives. That was one of the consequences of it, and it was pretty horrible. Uh, some of the behavior that came out of that. 
So I, I have a fairly critical, you know, eye about that sort of thing. I'm told I don't get it. I don't understand. But I, I think I do. I, I really don't think it's that complicated. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there are reasons that are good enough to cyber stalk and harass and, and ruin people's lives. That's the kind of crap Scientology gets up to. And when, when you know, gamer boys decide that they have the a power and authority to do that to people that they disagree with, I, I think they're crazy. You know, I, I don't think that's right. Um, and that's the kind, of, exactly, that's the kind of people who are, no, this isn't, this isn't free speech enough. I need to say worse things about these women and, and about the gaming community in general, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, over to 8chan they go. And, and like I said, I think the person who actually created this whole thing, you know, Fred, uh, kind of, you know, realizing the, the, the error of his ways, you know, is now pushing back against all of that stuff. So it's, it's, I think that tells you something about, you know, the, how, how positive and, and uh, free spirited and wonderful all of this free speech was, you know, <laughs> right. I have some issues with that. Um, okay, but as far as um as far as you know the origin story of q on this board this is the thing that really blows me away is how this whole thing kind of developed because q was not he was he this account and we say he it could have well been a she we don't know but this account was saying things that were not really that different from what other anonymous posters were saying. And, and a lot of the elements of the QAnon conspiracy, the, the, the pedophiles in the DNC, Hillary's an awful person, Trump is the savior figure. I mean, these things were being said by other people, too, earlier than Q coming around. So what, what was it about Q that that stood out or made it look different or somehow incited interest where other people posting similar things didn't generate that same level of interest is that because i think that's a very key question at the heart of this whole thing yeah yeah uh, and i think when you get right down to like you said what was different about q than the other posters and i think this plays into the kind of well it, into defining what Q is versus what's Q adjacent. Um, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that later, I'm sure. But I think the defining feature of Q that, that made it so intriguing and compelling to the people who got involved with it was the, the central concept of the identity of Q even, which was that it was a person or a team of people who are, uh, ironically, almost a sort of benevolent deep state within the United States government. So, you know, that, and he describes it different ways through different, or they or whoever describe it different ways through different posts. Um, at, at one point, they post and say that Q is uh, fewer than 10 people and only three non-military. So that's one description that they give. You know, so there's this, you know, that you can kind of fill in the blanks and it's like, okay, you know, three to 10 people high up in the government, you know, the, the name Q comes from, um, in, in one post, they started with, with the header line, Q clearance patriot, which, you know, Q clearance is a top level uh, department of energy clearance. And then they also imply that that means not just Q clearance, but the top level of clearance in in every department. So you know the the idea is it's this super spy type, you know, high ranking government official or group of high ranking go government officials that are anonymous and unknown to anyone but each other and to you know, of course, President Trump and and whoever else they're involved with. Um, and that I think is the unifying central concept that makes Q different than, say, you know, predecessors like um, High Level Insider and on was another, uh, you know, role play deal that went on before that. FBI and on was one. Um, there, there were you know several along those same lines of somebody going on and saying, "Hey, I'm you know this government agent, and here's my insider information." Uh, but 
you know, the, the concept of Q was a little bit more robust because it wasn't just one person and you didn't have any real idea which people it was supposed to be. You know, and there's been lots of speculation among the, the QAnon community over the years of who is and who isn't, you know, part of the Q team. Uh, well, yeah, and it's such an odd place to go the department of energy i mean that's a that's like kind of weird you know like like because q is a specific level for top secret clearance in the department of energy not in the fbi not in the cia not in the nsa (laughs) department of energy like what that that i think can be explained and this and of course nothing with QAnon is sure or certain but i think where that came from is the original um topic of interest that that was being discussed when when q got started on posting was the um uranium one scandal deal that you know if you if you remember that that you know supposedly hillary and obama had orchestrated uh selling uranium to iran and russia and whoever right. illegally out of the united states and and pocketed the profits and whatnot and in, let's, I don't remember the exact date, but about a, a week before the first canonical Q drops, uh, the Hill had just run another story about Uranium One. And so that, that was on the poll board, that was kind of the, the topic at the time was Uranium One, um, you know, Bob Mueller's investigation into the 2016 election um, you know, and whatever scope that was, and he was about to uh, indict. You know, about to to announce the first indictments in that that weekend. Also, so there's this kind of conflux of you know the 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 users of the poll board, which they refer to themselves as Polax. Um, <laughs> they they were talking about. Uh, uranium one and they're talking about you know Mueller's investigation and there's already this idea even then that Mueller was maybe investigating things beyond just the 2016 election uh so you know there there's there was speculation that you know who's he gonna indict and some people were saying he is gonna you know like indict Donald Trump himself or (laughs) people in his in his campaign or administration and then other people were saying, no, it's going to be, you know, Hillary and her camp. And there, you know, was, that was the topic of discussion at the time. Uh, and that's, that's where Q came up, you know, his first few weeks of, or first week or so of posts were basically all about Hillary and all the things that Hillary was supposed to have done, including Uranium One. And I think that's where the Q clearance thing comes in. It's because, you know, it, anyone who's going to know about where did the uranium go and all that is probably going to have Q clearance. Of course, Department of Energy makes total sense. They're in charge of our nuclear stockpile. Right. Uh, okay, got it. So interesting, conf- you know, sort of confabulation of events there. Um, now, the LARPing thing, the live action role playing, this idea of taking an account and saying you are you know, X government employee, or you work for X, you know, alphabet organization, and you have this insider knowledge. This is something that was going on on 4chan for some time before Q came along. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, there there were several, you know, it was a constant low level thing among the users. But it, there were also several, you know, that kind of got started and none to the degree that Q has, but he uh, or they definitely weren't the first on the scene uh, right. just the most successful so far well exactly very successful obviously i mean by by their standards you know q was fantastically uh successful but did anyone really take these accounts seriously or were the people on the boards aware of the fact that these guys were probably just screwing around um, what was the both. spirit of it, you know? Yeah, it was, I mean, there there was a lot of, um, a lot of people on either side at, uh, on any LARP on 4chan. 
And and part of that is that, you know, because it's an anonymous board, um, a lot of the, especially the lower level LARPers would be, and and I say LARPers, a lot of them weren't, um, or possibly could could not be, but it would be people saying like, oh, I was, you know, in, in you know, special forces in the army in Afghanistan, and here's what we did in 2008 or whatever, you know, and, uh-huh. it, and like, you know, that, that could be a, an operator posting on there and no one has any way to tell unless you have direct knowledge of that operation, which is what a handful of people in the whole world or whatever. So there, there was always the, the idea on the, on the boards that someone saying something like that could in fact be a special operator or an FBI agent or a, a department of energy employee or whatever. Um, and that was kind of the, you know, actually one of the like interactive elements of it was probing these claims and such and testing like, Hey, well, you know, and like asking, asking them questions and saying, Hey, prove it. Like if you, if you really are an FBI agent, tell me this and that, you know, and, or, or coming in and, and, and sometimes you'd, you'd see a LARP and a counter LARP or someone else would say, no, I'm an FBI agent in that office. And this guy's, you know, telling stories or whatever. And, right. um, so it, it was, it was part of the kind of built into the, really the nature of the website that you never were really sure what was, a you know, what was true and what wasn't among what was being said and testing that out was part of the interaction on the board, part of the engagement. Okay. And, and, I and it, that, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I believe that's where most of the predecessors to to Q kind of failed was they tried to, you know, tell too big a story and then it blew up on them because, you know, reality wasn't backing up what they were saying. Right. So it's not that the people on these boards are completely uncritical, don't ask questions, don't probe. I mean, it, it's, it seems like quite a lively place for that. Yeah, and in fact, it, um, it, it's it's a an argument you can make that the reason Q moved off of the poll board onto Calm Before the Storm in the first place was because he was they were getting so much uh, you know backlash and criticism for being a LARP. Um, I, I'm not going to throw off our stream by trying to screen share it, but we <laughs> uh, one of our data scientists in the Q Origins project, Robert, has made this little time series tool where you can you know search for a, a term used in the in the 4chan posts and the and the you know he's, he's built a database of all the q drops and all the threads related to those um you can you can search for the use of a term and and get a graph of you know how often that term was used and when you search for larp you see right at the start this big spike of <laughs> of it be you know of the use of larp in those threads and and as soon as q moved off of pole to calm before the storm it plummets back down off that cliff you know you have to infer from that data because it's not you know q does never say well we're moving because we're being called but you can make that inference just based on that data that maybe you know they're getting too much backlash and like i don't like it here anymore and and moved off Got it. Um, when they move to this other board, can they can they control who goes on that board or who gets to comment there? Uh, no. On 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 calm before the storm, they couldn't. That was that was um, the board owner for that was a separate person. Okay. In theory, um, <laughs> because we still don't know who Q was, and there's there's also the theory that the guy who ran calm before the storm was part of the I guess you'd say writing team behind Q, uh, but nothing substantiated. Um, okay. But on, on that board, the users, you know, in, anyone could show up on that board and, and post. Um, I think the reason that the accusations of LARPing fell off that cliff was because only the people who believed in Q followed him over there. Exactly. So, yeah. And and then again, when, when they moved off of 4chan over to 8chan, you know, same deal. Only only the the true believers followed them off of 4chan. And at that at that point, Q did get his own board to 
to post on exclusively. Got it. And this all happened, actually, I was surprised in reviewing how, how quickly this all went down. This was within the first couple months. It went, you know, boom to boom to boom over to 8chan. And, and then, uh, you know, crossed the fire line on, to, on the major social media, YouTube and Reddit. Right. Um, and that was that that move i say move expansion really yeah uh partly was driven by social media figures that were already established uh tracy diaz was one yep uh coleman rogers and i forget his his partner's name but they had a a show called patriot soapbox that they ran you know and these were these were before q even showed up these people had their own youtube channels and whatnot and that with with their own audiences and so when when they kind of took up the q banner that spread it to those groups and of course that's you know still kind of isolated pockets and i believe at some point in i want to say in that first january right after they had moved to 8chan the anons on 8chan actually started um, you know, developing plans and actually mobilizing to take, you know, explicitly take the the QAnon content over to Facebook, to Reddit, to uh, you know, Twitter, where wherever else they were. Um, which, in just a few months after that, I think it was in 2018 that that Reddit caught on that this was a lot of violent rhetoric and shut down i believe 11 subreddits that were q and on or or related to that um but then you know and it but it survived on on twitter for a long time it survived on i mean facebook still is not has not done much to 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 cut it off of there right um yeah, and they say can, they've banned them all, but then they start new ones, and it doesn't really. Yeah, you which, know, it's just this you know, endless whack a mole. <laughs> yeah, it, there's there's a there's a question of how much of it is you know Facebook being lax, and how much of it is that they have what is it three or four billion users, and and how do you even moderate that? So exactly. Uh, but yeah, the, the the push off of eight chan onto social media was. Um, largely in due to a deliberate campaign right by the anons to to get the word out right and if you grant that this is a group of people who actually believe what they're selling that they that they really believe that this conspiracy of you know pedophiles and the sex rings and the and the comet ping pong pizza place and it, they really believe this stuff then you can sort of grant that maybe they have good intentions that 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 yeah. that trying to spread this word was uh, you know trying to ring the ring the alarm bell trying to set off the fire alarm trying to hey guys oh my god do you 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 wouldn't believe this and all of mainstream media is in on it so so you're never going to know about this otherwise and we have to bring you this this amazing insider truth is that is that how they were really thinking about this or was it more of a money grab i mean <laughs> what was going on here with this well and again there's there's some of both because there there are and were uh true believers that that believe they were doing a good thing and then you know there's always the opportunists that will say hey we can we can fleece these guys you know and and jump in and take what they can um i think and, and of course the 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 grifters and opportunists in such a thing always by necessity are the the minority otherwise there's no economy for the grift right. um but yeah the there, there is a, a large contingent of them that are acting in good faith in their own minds, and you, you know you saw that in things like the the um, the Wayfair theories. Uh, what was that last summer? Um, that you know the the idea that uh, Wayfair was in, engaged in child trafficking, and you could go and search for you know search for a name on Wayfair and it'd pull up like a a jessica 
um, dresser and and end table set or whatever, right. and and that represent and it would be like twenty five thousand dollars, and it's like that's not a dresser, that's a child, there, you know, and and like a, a, a lot of people got brought in on that, saying, oh, this is child trafficking, and you know, we're submitting tips to the FBI and to um, different child trafficking, you know, nonprofits and stuff. Like, hey, check this, you know, follow this lead, follow that lead. And thought they were helping, um, and instead were just bogging down the system with false leads. But well, that, um, exactly. And in fact, this speaks to why you see soccer moms and Ashley Babbitt type women uh, connecting up with this movement is because they they oh my god, child trafficking. What you know? They're not yeah. they're not from 4chan. They're not down sharing neo Nazi gifts. They're they're concerned about kids. And, right. you know, so, so there's different vectors, I guess you could say, different ways people have entered into this that, that really had nothing to do with, with its earlier beginning of 4chan and 8chan. Yeah, um, and that's, um, you know, an, an aspect of how it grew to be so big is that yeah. the, the core principle is so vague and nonspecific, you know, that there's a group in the government fighting a deep state or whatever that you can then start to apply that to all kinds of different things. And so, you know, child trafficking is one, election fraud is one, COVID conspiracy is one. And, you know, you can, in, in, I mean, it's, it's a, it's basically just the, the bureaucratic formulation of a good versus evil template. That's right. So, you know, you can apply that, you know, there's, there's a, the good government officials and the bad government officials, and that's who's at war in, in the QAnon universe. Uh, so, and, you know, it's a, it's ties, you know, same thing with any other kind of, you know, like religious good versus evil construction, any kind of tribalist us versus them construction, you know, it's the same, the same framework of how, how to think about these issues, you know, acting on good faith in their own minds to do the right thing without realizing that the underpinnings of it are bogus and unfounded. Exactly. I really wanted to get to that point and highlight that in this episode is that it's not, it, you know, the entire movement is not, you know, a bunch of neo-Nazis that, 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 that a bunch of people glommed onto this you know, later on. And that's, and that's one of the ways it became the mother of all conspiracy theories is, is you have to have everybody piling into this thing from so many different places, even, uh, and can you comment on this in terms of when other groups started piling into this? I think once it got onto Reddit or onto YouTube, because I, I know at one point there was, um, there were people in the QAnon world who were, uh, complaining that the flat earthers had gotten on board now <laughs> yeah um i i was listening to a, a podcast called straight white american jesus there, i don't know if you've heard of that it's it's pretty wow. good um it's a a couple of uh one, one of them's an ex-evangelical uh i think he was a youth pastor for a while and, and deconstructed and got out but he it he was interviewing um, Mark Andre Argentino last spring about QAnon, and and I was listening to it this spring, and um, you know they're they're talking about it, and you know Mark Andre is saying, yeah, everyone's welcome in QAnon except the flat earthers. If you're a flat earther, you're not welcome. And I I just laughed because by that point the flat earthers were welcome. You know they'd been incorporated too. So, right. Um, but yeah, and it's and that's that's again the the basic premise of that you can't trust the government because it's being run by a deep state. So if NASA says that the Earth is a globe, no, it's not. They're lying to you, and you know they don't even have to have a reason. Like why would NASA lie about the shape of the Earth? But yeah, I, but yeah, like that's that's how even even groups like that get brought in is there's that common tie of you know you can't either you can't trust the government or you can't trust the media or you know sometimes even just you know there's the the narrative all the way through which which 
Q started off saying this isn't about Republicans versus Democrats, uh, you know, in the early days. And then a year later for the 2018 elections, he was saying, you know, save America, vote Republican, uh, posting memes like that. So, right. you know, even that the political aspect of it on the face of it wasn't wasn't part of the mythos but then even that got brought in so yeah exactly well this thing has gone in some very interesting twists and turns i i can't help but comment on the evangelical factor there the religious factor and the faux religious trappings that that are brought into the QAnon conspiracy framework because uh, and flat earthers and their and their ilk are going to do this because a a, a huge part of the flat earth movement is about the uh it comes down if you trace the conspiracy down it goes to satan it goes to satan right it's it's all it, you know why would nasa lie about the shape of the earth well it's because it's all about deceiving you to take you away from god's true you know word and uh you know from the bible that the earth's flat and uh, right. and that and that this is the special creation of God, and we are God's special people. And if the Earth isn't flat, then that's not true. So it, the Earth has to be flat so that it will be true, right? And and it's, it's also, got very heavy religious overtones to it. Yes, I, I would like to point out it has to be flat, and it also has to be quadrilateral because the Bible says there are four corners yep. as well. That's right. So it's not a disc. <laughs> it's not a disc. It's a Okay. everything you've heard is a lie even the shape <laughs> that's right i mean it's it's wild when you start going down those holes but there is a heavy religious component to it and of course there's already a heavy religious component in in donald trump's followers i mean it's not you know it's really not hard to see how this cake got mixed with these different right. elements because these things have you know, they can find, you know, it's amazing that Trump supporters and flat earthers can find common ground, but they can quite easily, you know, right. on some of these points, on some of these foundational ideas. Now, not everybody's on board with this. Clearly, that whole religious framework I just discussed had nothing to do with the, with Q and his posts on 4chan or on 8chan. There, there wasn't any religious components as I as I understand it. I mean, but there were five thousand Q posts. I mean, did did he ever right. go the religious route? Uh, yeah, he he didn't cast it in explicitly religious terms as a like he didn't cast it as a spiritual battle um, primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, but they they did use even just in the first couple hundred drops. They did quote scripture several times. Ah, uh, um, okay. They no, they uh, one common catchphrase or refrain among the the Q drops is "God wins," uh, you know, and so they they are tapping into that religious aspect of it. Got it. Okay. Um, nothing very, nothing very specific, but you know, just just kind of almost like throwing a bone to to the yes. religious side of it yes like hey you know we're also on god's side um they also said some things that you know a, a proper christian person wouldn't say like in in one post he they they wrote uh the u.s military is the savior of mankind and i'm fairly certain that's um sacrilege directly but uh, well it all depends on uh, on how you're uh, how you're framing the the uh, God's army. <laughs> good point. Good point. Yeah, I mean, you can. You, it's it's amazing the 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 mental gymnastics that go on with 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 certain conspiracists. Um. Wow. Okay. So, is there anything I I wanted to take the bulk of this show because I, this the, the, this might not be the only talk that you and I have about this. I want to keep our shows to a to a moderate length, but I um but there's a there's a lot to talk about here. Is there more about the 4chan experience or the well of 4chan and, ha and how this came out of that, kind of crawled out of it, really, um, that we haven't talked about yet or any aspect of that that I haven't asked you about? Uh, you did mention it earlier. I don't think we've covered it. The kind of like crowdsourced aspect yes. of it. Yes. 
Yes, thank you for reminding me. That's right. One of the things, let me let me tell the audience, one of the things that I am most fascinated by with the phenomena of the Q conspiracy and the and the creation of it is the crowdsourced aspect of the dogma. It's not a central person dictating to the comma and to the letter what the dogma is. Instead, you have these cryptic drops, these Q drops, these these messages that could mean almost anything, uh, and some of them really do have multiple interpretations. Um. And then it's up to the community and this layer of interpreters called bakers to interpret these Q-drops. And then, if I understand it from what I've read and heard, the community, the, the followers, the Anons, are the ones who kind of vote in which is and isn't official dogma as uh, reinforced by Q, who will sometimes, but not always, confirm or deny that a baker got it right. So sometimes Q is dictating the terms of what he is saying, but other times, here you go, guys. Here's your, here's your, you know, uh, chum for the day and make of it what you will. And then they go on and make all kinds of crazy hash out of it and form a dogma, form a conspiracy theory, a, a, you know, a, a religious framework of ideas uh, around these drops, around these interpretations of these drops, am I stay? Am I describing this accurately? Yeah, that is that is pretty accurate, um, especially in the the later formulations of it. Um, the kind of the structure of it was that Q had their board where they posted, but then on on the other board where the anons were allowed to post, uh, they would. They would build what they called Doe, which was just a list of news articles, um, you know, Twitter links, YouTube links, whatever, you know, whatever information they thought might be relevant. And then, yeah, like you said, the bakers would go in, take all this stuff, link it together and, you know, bake it into bread or, uh, you know, it's kind of a weird analogy because they start with bread crumbs. Right. And turn it in. To dough anyway. Um, <laughs> I know it's so it strains even their analogy. <laughs> yeah, it's it, you know it's it's technical lingo in in the industry. You know, um, but but yeah, that's that's how it works. Um, and, and even even right from the start, it wasn't that refined of a process. But in the first week of of Q posting on 4chan. You could you can go back at those threads and look and see that you know the the anons would be talking about whatever different subjects and then you know sometime half an hour an hour later Q would address that topic in a drop and they were always worded you know as if it was his original idea to say these things but you can go back and see like okay the Q drops are they they appear to be original content that are being you know put out by you know a, a government agent in the know or whatever but if you go look at the context of them they kind of also appear to be driven by the community uh, you know banter and chatter at the time so you know one good example is um the uh the week the the weekend after q started posting that was what was supposed to be uh, what some people refer to as the Antifa apocalypse, that there was that Antifa was supposed to have had these, you know, massive riots planned all across the US and whatever, and that it wasn't gonna be safe to like to go into the cities and whatnot, because you might get shot or whatever. And that that was kind of the topic of discussion, you know, in the like you know, November first through November third, because it was supposed to be on on the fourth. Um, and that was part of where Q came in was saying, you know, part of his pitch was that these riots are planned to distract everyone and cover up from that. We're going to start arresting the deep state, you know, which will be a lot of people's favorite politicians. But you, you, when you go through that thread, you see, 
you started that thread with uh, saying, you know, this you'll see this weekend we're delivering on the MAGA promise and, and launches into talking about the arrests and whatnot. And then in that thread, Anons were saying things like, hey, my kids have a soccer game this weekend or, you know, I'm I'm scheduled to work in the city this weekend. Do I need to call off of work and do I need to head to my parents place outside of town? You know, stuff like this. And even though Q doesn't reply directly, you know, because on 4chan, you can click a post and reply to it. Um, he didn't reply to any specific posts, but the, you know, s several of his drops were about we're not saying these things to scare anybody. Um, you know, in, any military you see is for your protection, things like that. Um, wow. Another another instance was talking about, you know, the, the Anons were talking about, do they need to slow roll this or do it all at once? And, you know, there's discussion about that. And one, one in particular, because most posts on 4chan are, you know, two sentences average. And one of the Anons wrote, uh, you know, a couple paragraphs about it saying they like, no, they need to get this done, but they can't afford to wait. Why are they dragging this out? And, and again, without replying directly to that, Q addressed that and said, you know, maybe someday we can, we can do that, but we can't do it all at once, you know? So even right from the start, you can see where, what Q was saying as if they were original thoughts, you know, prepared beforehand or whatever, is actually responsive to what the community was saying at the time. Right. That is, that's fascinating. That's an interesting point and an important one. Subtle because cult leaders do that too with their communities, with their people, with their followers. Hubbard was very responsive to, and in fact, taking a bunch of ideas from his followers and turning it into what became Scientology. But it was all filtered through him. And with this, it's not all filtered through Q. Uh, uh, you know, some of it is, and like I said, he's confirmed and denied some things, but but the 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 buildup of this of this conspiracy um, w was mainly a crowdsourced thing, and the responsiveness you mentioned there is fascinating because there was a give and take and a back and forth on this. Um, was Q always, you know, heavy pro Trump? Yeah, um, right from the start, the the narrative that they presented was that Trump was asked to run for president and that he was asked to run because he was the guy who was going to get the job done, basically. Uh, you know, that everyone else was corrupt. Trump was the only one who wasn't corrupt. You know, that's what like, the, the story is that, you know, the Q team approached him before he decided to run and said, hey, could you run for president for us? We need your help, basically. So, and uh, and some of that is hinted at in the in the Q drops. I don't remember to what degree Q pursued that narrative, but like you said, the community also, with their input, has has made that the official story. Interesting. Um, but yeah, he in and in fact, like Donald Trump was is kind of the only figure that Q was ever consistently for all through the rest of the drops um you know different figures so uh chris ray over the fbi or um who else I'm trying to think well even even uh bob moeller went you know went through the same thing where q would would say you know would indicate that this person was one of the good guys on their team or whatnot and then when the when that person's actions were not in trump's favor would then turn and say oh that you know they're a sleeper agent or they've been blackmailed or they've been corrupted you know things like that so right. you get these fun uh fun things like one q drop that said trust ray trust horowitz trust huber uh trust kansas which was mike pompeo um and then you know when you look back on it everyone listed in that post is either no longer relevant or has turned into one of the bad guys in the mythos. Right. So it, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing to look back on and see Q's explicitly saying, trust these five people. 
and then by you know a year later or so don't trust any of those people <laughs> One of the things that is so um, so interesting about this from a from a logical point of view or just from a consistency point of view is the inconsistency is the contradictions, the self contradictions and the uh, the complete reversals of, of views on certain things, as well as the, you know, uh, litany of failed predictions. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. I mean, the, the very first prediction. The very first statement was Hillary's getting indicted. She's going to jail. All these people are going to Gitmo. None of that has happened. And yet this thing carries on as though this is, you know, the delivered truth from heaven. So it's so it's quite weird. Um, what has been your observation of how those are dealt with? How how do they, the, you know, the, we call this cognitive dissonance, this, this you know, this, this, this business of it, 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 you know of, of contradictory, mutually exclusive ideas that they can't both be true, right? You know, Q is the deliverer of truth, and yet these things are not true. So, how do they resolve that? It, that that actually is also baked into the Q mythos directly. Um, and another, again, early on, um, this is foundational. And, and was done, I think, as a, a reaction to one of those failed predictions. Um, Q wrote that, first he wrote, distractions are, distractions are necessary, disinformation is real, and it got shortened later to disinformation is necessary. Right. And that's a foundational core tenet of, you know, because, again, you're talking about kind of this, shadow warfare between the good guys and the bad guys within the government and so it's you know they'll they'll reference sun tzu and talk about you know appear strong when you're weak appear weak when you're strong and you know that they bring in these concepts but that the idea is that some of the you know that the the drops are meant to guide you in the right direction but they're also meant to mislead the enemy and so you know they'll they'll um you know they'll say well that you know that that prediction didn't come true because it was supposed to mislead uh the deep state or whatever the the first big one was um that that weekend of november 3rd 2017 uh was when q had predicted already that there would be massive riots martial law um you know high ranking government officials arrested civil disrest blah 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 whatever um, none of that happened in the U.S., but where it did happen was in Saudi Arabia. So that was when um, – I'm getting the names mixed up. The crown prince in Saudi Arabia – you can go – we have the internet, yeah. Um, when he arrested, you know, 11 other of the Saudi princes or whatnot on corruption charges – and if I remember correctly, they they did have some kind of martial yeah, law. Yeah, Saudi type. Arabia arrests 11 princes, including billionaire. This is November 4th, 2017. Right. So, you no, know, November 4th was a day after originally predicted that Tony Podesta in the U.S. would be indicted and that we would have all these massive riots about it and all such in the U.S. National Guard called up and all that. And... You know, by the end of the day on November 4th, that had not happened, but the Saudi thing had happened. So Q, after the fact, came back and said, um, you know, go back and read what I wrote. All of that happened, but in Saudi Arabia. You know, it was, it was given in the context of the U.S. to predict the events in Saudi Arabia. And I think around that time is when he first said that, uh, you know, just the disinformation is is necessary jesus and, and this so, is early on this is november 2017 so this is within a month yep. of of appearing yep the second weekend that he that q was around so jesus um, so you have a group of people who who buy in willingly to the idea that the deliverer of our truth is going to deceive and lie us because to, to us because that's necessary and we're just going to roll with that Yep, that's 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 a um, 
they believe that's a virtue of Q and not a vice of Q. Right, it's a feature, not a bug. Exactly. Motherfuckers, man. I mean, you really can't, you you just can't make up the kind of stuff at that level because then then it really is true that it doesn't matter anymore what you say. Their facts don't matter anymore when that, is the foundational view of of how you're viewing the you know the, the epistemology the tr- you know the the knowledge source and the truth of it is 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 whatever you want it to be right it, and it allows also after the fact to look back in hindsight at, at whatever ends up you know whatever was said over here and whatever ends up happening over here and say I was right all along. Right. You know? <laughs> or at it's least, so Trumpian. Or at, least, <laughs> or at least I was on the right side. You know, not not necessarily right. I had the right idea, but I was on the right side of it the whole time. Right. And personally, I see a, a parallel between, you know, this concept of disinformation is necessary in, in QAnon and, you know, kind of the religious idea that, you know, God works in mysterious ways. Yes. And, and, you know, people, they'll do that same thing where they make a logical argument. Um, you know, one that I, that bugs me in particular is, you know, God made two genders. It's like, okay, well, it says that, you know, yeah, Genesis says he created mankind, male and female, but it, it also says that, you know, God, it refers to God as he, but God doesn't have sexual <laughs> organs. Right. So why, you know, and like, well, and, 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 or, you know, like God made Eve from Adam's rib. So if, if gender is sexual and sexuality is genetic, Eve was male. Right. And so, you know, and, but then it's like, well, but God, you know, God can change the genetics. And it's like, well, if you can just change things on the fly, anything's possible. <laughs> exactly. And, exactly. Yeah, and, and that's the same, same thing in Q. That's so. right. Well, you know, a lot of people don't know that, you know, they, this term cognitive dissonance gets bandied about a lot. And it, and it should be because it's an important concept. And it has everything to do with how we buy into complete bullshit. And I and it comes from the, 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 the whole psychological concept of it comes from a study, uh, you know, from the 1950s of doomsday cults of a, of a doomsday cult that made very specific predictions. Those predictions did not come true. The world did not end on that date. And the believers kept believing. And the guy said another date and another one, another one. And we've seen this in history. This isn't just something that happened in the 1950s. This happened in the 1800s and the 1700s. All kinds of doomsday cults and groups have, have existed through time. And they have continued to follow their leader despite, you know, failed outright blatantly wrong predictions. And they just keep going. And, and this cognitive dissonance is a psychological explanation for why. Mm-hmm. And and we see it with mass movements, uh, you know, like QAnon as well. Uh, we really see it everywhere. I mean, it's it, it goes on all over the place, and it's not just about failed predictions, but it's it's an interesting mental phenomenon. Is, is all I will say about that. Um, so okay, so we so he sets up, you know, this uh, sort of whether it was premeditated or not. He set up this this mechanism so anything he had to say was going to end up being believed or accepted or true or thought of that way. And then this thing starts growing. What kind of numbers are we talking about when it was when it was just constrained on 4chan and 8chan? How many people were actually involved in this at that time? That's a, a very difficult question to answer, even just from the technical side of it, okay. because of the anonymity of those sites. Right. Um, you can kind of qualitatively take a guess at it by, you know, looking at what posts seem similar to other posts, and you can also kind of, you know, make guesses based on post volume and such. Um, I don't have those numbers in front of me anywhere okay but well are we talking when it when when it moved over to 8chan for example and he got his own board he got his own site and people started you know responding to that are we talking about tens hundred i'm just kind of wondering order of magnitude is it tens is it hundreds is it thousands how many people were actively following that in a rough sense um from what i've seen and again taking guesses based you know kind of an educated guess based on 
what you can tell just looking at the anonymous posts. Yeah. Um, I'm, it looks like it was probably maybe a thousand total, but you know, a hundred or, or maybe hundred to 200 that were active or semi-active and, and, and there's no way to, to tell on those, you know, how many people would go and, and read everything every day on all the boards and never post anything. Right. And, and, you know, really no way to tell even just like which people, you know, were, were posting consistently unless they put a name on it, which is pretty uncommon on, on those sites. Right. Um, but just, you know, based on kind of the flow of conversation, posting volume, things like that, at that time, I believe it was, you know, a couple hundred active users. Right. And those, uh, okay, well, those are good, those are good guesses because they line up also with a paper I read. I, I got it around here somewhere. I'll have to, I'll have to dig it up, Wh- which was an analysis of Vote, V-O-A-T, which was a site similar to Reddit that sprung up that, you know, where they went and had dedicated boards. And a, a, a very searching uh, analysis was done of the activity on that board. And it was, um, it was very few. It was, very, it was a few people posting a lot of content, and then a bunch of people sort of following that content. But it was really, the analysis showed that, the, that, that it was really only a few people generating the, the bulk of the Q content you know with whether with other with a few hundred people chiming in you know it was it was not a huge activity when it was you know constrained on those boards right and i think even to this day it's the numbers of primary content generators are still pretty small you know i think most of them are on telegram these days you can go it's you know 30 or 40 people that are generating 98% 98% of the content related to the QAnon. Exactly. And this is why I push back when people suggest that there are millions of people, you know, who are part of QAnon. I go, mm, I think that there are a lot of people who would agree with some aspect of the QAnon conspiracy, but that doesn't make you a QAnon. And and I think that I think that that the media has hyped this in an irresponsible way when it comes to the numbers on this because when you put out a poll that sixty percent of Americans are on board with QAnon, you just go, hang on, hang on, you know yeah. that's just not true, you know. And that's the that's the epistemological difficulty of there being so many different groups that are uh, what I keep referring to as Q adjacent, right? You know, thing because like. Stop the steal. Um, you know now we're now you can people are starting to include like mysticism, you know, star seed, alien disclosure type stuff. Right. Uh, you know, so a, a lot of things that even if e- even if QAnon never existed, might have sprung up. You know, stop the steal could have possibly been a purely, you know, Republican political establishment theory even without something like QAnon to drive it. But because there's overlap there, yeah, journalists or writers or whoever will often lump it, lump that in and say, you know, QAnon-related beliefs or whatever. It, rather than, than millions of people believing kind of the core concept of QAnon, I think it's probably closer to, a, you know, 200,000, give or take 100,000, depending. And again, it's, it's because it's not, there's no centralized registry or anything it's you know you kind of have to add up numbers here and there and and take a guess but i believe actually um i believe mark andre argentino recently did uh work alongside with logically.ai i believe is who did it don't quote me on this i might be citing the wrong source entirely but they they did an analysis you know kind of a deep dive analysis on active users on telegram in uh qanon no explicitly qanon related channels i think they came up with 135,000 for you know people that have posted more than once <laughs> on on any of these um so you know that's and and that's going to be you no know, and again there's going to be you know 10 times that that go read this stuff and and who knows whether they actually believe it or not Exactly. 
And like in that in that analysis, I'd come up as an active user in a QAnon channel because I'm on Telegram, you know, arguing with people all the time. But uh, yeah, but you're, as, you're hardly a QAnon. <laughs> no, I, uh, no, I, I play the part sometimes just for to to try to get a point across. But um, but yeah, it, it just you know, there's a lot of it's a hard thing, hard metric to to lock down to a to a very uh solid number but somewhere in that range you know 100 100 to 200,000 right right the, and those numbers that make a lot more sense to me i mean i've i've uh got earlier history with the flat earth movement right and and you get the media a couple of years ago you know pre qanon they were hyping up flat earth oh my god flat earth and there was a you know, international conventions of flat earthers were were happening. One happened here in Denver, so I went to it. And you know, you you find out is these are very very tiny groups of people who who really believe this stuff and are following it on a daily basis. You're talking about a very small group of people, but people mm-hmm. freak out about it. What? And then their videos get a few hundred thousand views, and it's like, oh my god, look at all these flat earthers. And it's like, no, just because you watch the video doesn't make you a flat earther, right? You know, so. Seems people people do like to to uh, get a little hysterical about this at times, but that being said, uh, I have uh, said a few times now, and I will repeat that I am bothered by QAnon because of the fact that it has jumped from an online only, you know, crazy think sort of thing to actual very real world consequences. Um, and that's not to be ignored, and that's not to be, you know, uh, dismissed or just thought of as, you know, as some silly thing. Um, I, I don't. I take January sixth very seriously. I take it very seriously, and I and QAnon was part of that. It wasn't the only thing going on there, and QAnons were not the only group of people represented in that crowd of people who marched on the Capitol, but they were there. And this and the symbology is there, and the effort to overthrow the government was there, and that's that's very disturbing to me. And there are other instances of um, of hardware, you know, guns and whatnot being brought out into public areas, and you know, attempts being made to hurt or uh, you know otherwise uh, mess with with people and with with the government. So I think that there, you know, that this can create or can contribute to. A person's radicalization, and I and I am bothered by that. I'm 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 both intrigued and and professionally curious about it because I want to uh, figure out ways to de-radicalize people. That's my thing. But mm-hmm. um, and the fact that this does radicalize or can radicalize people, meaning can get them incited into a state where they're willing and able to engage in real world violence. That's what's meant by radicalization. It's not just keyboard warriors saying nasty things to each other. It's actual real-world activity. So that's where I am most concerned about where these, you know, where these beliefs go is because the, the beliefs inform the crazy action that follows. What can you comment on or talk about in that regard with this movement? And I mean, do you see with what's happening? Like Q, I don't think has dropped anything all year, right? No, his Q's last drop was December eight. Uh, the The last few drops were, you know, pretty well meaningless even by QAnon standards. One was a picture of a giant flag. Uh, you know, one was a YouTube video of a uh, like a movie soundtrack song. Um, but wow. the um, as far as you know, and and. Again, we we can't count out QAnon just because we can count out Q, right? Because even even uh, I I checked in on it last week. The Q Research Board on Eight Coon is still like I I popped in twice about thirty minutes apart, and there had been over a thousand posts in between. It's oh wow! Very, yeah, it's it's still a very active community. Um, I, but it's you know they're not they're not gone there there's a someone posted you know wrote a news article a few weeks ago QAnon is dead and, and you know all of us that study it just kind of <laughs> laughed right nope no it's not uh, <laughs> nope. it's metastatized is what it is 
Um, but um, yeah, and and when you're looking, you know, you're you're talking about radicalization and and you know even a hundred thousand people still being a problem because it can radicalize, you know, and like um, January sixth, they've made what a little over four hundred arrests so far. That's right. Um, you know, you're you're talking about maybe a couple thousand people total that actually, you know, cross the line into the Capitol building. Um, and, and mo- you know, a lot of those people walked in and, and walked around and left again and, you know, didn't break anything, you know, like the, the number of people that actually engaged in anything was very small, much larger than it should have been. But, you know, that that's one aspect of it is that out of a group of 100 or 200,000 people, you only need a tenth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent of them to to be willing to do something violent for it to be a problem. That's right. Um, and on the other on the other side of it, a hundred thousand people driving this discourse of um, you know of anti-vax rhetoric or whatever or you know election fraud stuff like it. That's a lot of even though it's not a large percentage of the population having that driving factor there where there's, you know, you have 300 friends on Facebook and, you know, one of them once a day, you know, shares something or posts something that's election fraud or whatever. It's like, you're still, if you're still seeing that in, in the conversation every day, it still becomes part of the social landscape, even if it's just that tiny percentage, you know, the, the, it, it gets amplified, especially, you know, with the internet connecting everything to everything else all the time these days. That's right. Um, That's right. And it also, it also acts as a bit of a beacon or a lighthouse for, you know, for people who are already of a fringe mindset. You know, they're already, you know, the lumpen proletariat or however you want to call them, right? The, 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 the class without a class, the people who feel disenfranchised and don't understand why. And are looking for, and and they don't really quite grasp how things work, you know how the government works. They didn't really pay attention in civics. They didn't really, you know, get how how things actually work. And so these simple Simon sort of weird ideas of how things work appeal to them, you know, and they think that they are getting some sacred knowledge or sacred truth. And that's that's just part and parcel of the whole thought reform cult mindset: is I've got the knowledge, I've got the truth, and you don't. And I'm special and I'm a special person because I have this and you don't. And it makes them feel empowered, you know, and that and that's a very dangerous place to be when you're empowered with false information, with things that are just factually wrong and you're 100 percent sure they're right. So that's that is what, you know, starts the othering, starts the us versus them, starts the the road down a path that can lead to you standing on the Hoover Dam with an M16 demanding that, you know, there be a government reform right now or things are going to get ugly, right? I mean, that's where that goes. Right. And, you know, 30 years ago, you know, the the person that had this idea would be kind of isolated within their community and um, I had this conversation, same kind of conversation with a friend recently about, uh, you know, like paranoid schizophrenics. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, such a, there's a small percentage of people that believe the government is watching their every move or that they're being gang stalked or whatever. And in the past, it was just, you know, you know, Joe down the street that thought that and he's, you know, he's harmless. He has weird ideas, but we watch out for him. It's OK. Well, now it's, you know, Joe down the street hops on Reddit or whatever and goes to, you know, the paranoid schizophrenics board. And now there's a whole community of them that are amplifying this this idea that's right that's uh, that's 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 exactly how it works and that's and that's exactly what's happening and i do want to say i'm not trying to stigmatize paranoid schizophrenia it's just an an example of you know where um where something that used to be you know maybe a couple of people had this belief or this idea yeah now now they can form a community of you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of them all at once um and you know ideas that used to be dampened by you know dampened and balanced out and and uh kind of buffered a bit by society are now just 
all thrown together and amplified and built on instead. Um, exactly. Exactly. And unfortunately, we have only been partially well served by the media in this regard. Because if you go back to 2017, 2018, and you see the original reporting on QAnon, you do not see, you know, you see it being pointed at, laughed at, thought is ridiculous, you know, these crazy people. But you don't see an understanding of what we just discussed, right? That that you can have um, that that the internet is kind of growing these communities because of its nature, and um, and that's the actual problem here. Because you're always going to have fringy, crazy, goofy ideas. There's no there's no way we're not. We're always going to have that percentage of people. Mentally ill or not, that's not really the implication here. You know, you you mentioned paranoid schizophrenia. Well, paranoia is a psychiatric diagnosis, but it also is just a state of mind that you can get into if you read enough crap. You know, it's not. You know, we're not. We're not. We don't have to cross. You know, lines into psychiatric diagnoses in order to understand that there are fringe people with fringe ideas, and they and they and when they get together, it gets a little scary. You know, because there's power in numbers, and and that's really all we're trying to say here. We're not trying to, you know, write some new manifesto on the dangers of mental health. So, <laughs> right. you know, so so it's all good. I, I think I think the audience gets where we're coming from on this. Um, okay, well, Gavin, we're going to start wrapping up right now because we've been talking for a bit and we've covered a lot of territory on this that I wanted to deep dive into and get more explanations on from somebody who has more experience and knowledge about this. And you have served that function wonderfully today. So I really want to thank you for, for taking the time to help me with this. Well, thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed it. Absolutely. Cool, man. Uh, you all can follow, you know, Q Origins Project on Twitter or check out, you know, some of the names we've dropped during this episode here, uh, Mark and others who are doing very serious work to try to follow and understand this, you know, uh, phenomena of, of QAnon. Um, are there any other sources that people might want to glom on to to follow this or find out more about it? Uh, yeah, there's a few a few uh, writers that do this for a living. You could follow uh, Mike Rothschild on Twitter. You mentioned Mark Andre Argentino, uh, Q Origins Twitter account, which that's the the handle at Q Origins. Um, that's that's the project I'm involved in. And um, if you follow any of those people, they tend to retweet each other a lot. Um, the QAnon Anonymous podcast is another. Um, those those would be where I'd start. So right. Q Origins, Q Anon Anonymous, Mike Rothschild, especially, um, and then you know just I think one of the the best resources to follow is just check out what you read on the internet and don't believe it just because you read it on the internet. Um, this goes for you know me as well if you read something that i wrote don't take my word for it go <laughs> go check it out um you know compare what facts line up look for the tricky language and things um i i do a lot of the this research to to highlight issues but what i really wish is that people thought critically about it themselves so I didn't have to write about it. So exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I certainly can't disagree with a word you just said there. That is exactly right. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for coming around, and listening to us gab on here about this. And I hope that this podcast was informative and um, educational, and perhaps entertaining at the same time. And if you think that the channel and the content I'm putting out is worthwhile and is something worth supporting, then please do follow me on Patreon. Or, of course, you can always throw me some love through PayPal. Very much appreciate your listeners, uh, my, rather your support out there and uh, in, inviting us into your home this week. Let's see you next week. Bye-bye.